espionage against nature, artillery logic, political metallurgy. Quoting Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, from exhortation to the German people to better exercise their understanding in their language. With medals we are an advantage in Europe, and our metallic arts have risen to the highest level. We were the first to transform iron into steel and copper into brass. We invented the galvanization of iron and discovered many other useful sciences, so that our artisans have become teachers to the whole world in noble chemistry and mining. If in numerous sciences, or better, knowledge disciplines, a latent or open declaration of enmity on the part of the knower against the objects has been uncovered, the concepts of conventional epistemology, subject, object, appear in another light. Subject means the subjugated one. In other languages, therefore, it is the homonym of untertan, sujet, subject. In rhetoric, the subject is the topic. In police jargon, the suspect. If this subject now rises to the nub of modern epistemologies, that is not merely a word displacement. What is hidden behind it is nothing short of a revolution. Subjectivity strives for sovereignty, and to do this the subjugated wants to subjugate whatever it can subjugate. We observe a complete inversion. Also, with regard to suspicion, the suspect, subject, becomes the one who suspects. The subjugated one subjugates the surrounding world and makes it into the epitome of data, of given facts for itself. Given to whom? The commanding subject. The data gives themselves into the hands without its having to give itself back to them. Out of the subjugated arises the ruler over what is given. This inversion, in latent form probably relatively old, in, ma- ma- <coughs> in manifest form a modern phenomenon, constitutes the a priori of the transcendental polemic. The war of the subjects who make the other, opponent or thing, into an object, produces for the first time the foil for the polemical objectivity of the scientific, enlightenment, disciplines. The thing that stands against, gegen, me, becomes an object, gegenstand. Every object, if we take it in itself, or an sich, is a potential rebel, a counter-ego, or a means in the struggle against me. Just as the ego only became the subject in a philosophical sense, a maker of subjects is rebel against what subjugates it. In the will to knowledge, interests are always astir that do not exhaust themselves in knowledge as such, but serve the subjects as weapons against the objects. Objective knowledge, quote-unquote, in this sense possesses the character of a weapon. The concept weapon appears to me to have precedence over the concept tool. Therefore, a mere critique of instrumental reason does not sufficiently grasp the domain of the polemical. Is all this supposed to hold also for the model sciences of modern rationality, the natural sciences? Can the assertion be defended that these sciences viewed nature, their object, primarily in a hostile or a hostilely neutral way? Precisely in the natural sciences, and all the more in biological and physical foundational research, a relatively peaceful self-understanding seems then as now to predominate but the appearance is deceiving. To be sure, all sciences also possess a contemplative wing, but they do not fly with it. What calls the sciences to life are the imperatives of praxis, of competition and production, politics, war. One of the philosophical achievements of ecology is the demonstration that, no matter how they understand themselves, The modern natural sciences, as the fundamental sciences of industrial technology, are caught in a process that, if one weighs the facts, can only be described as a war of exploitation and annihilation of advanced civilization against the biosphere. 
By the way, it was a German Jewish philosopher, Theodore Lessing, whose influence, if one can speak of such a thing, was felt in the time of the Weimar Republic, who laid the foundations for an ecological philosophical critique of predatory Western industry. The tracks of the super predator can be followed up into the heights of epistemology. The gaze of the plunderer who roams through organic as well as inorganic nature. Today we see more and more how futile all attempts are at once again contemplative. How futile all attempts are to once again contemplatively neutralize the results of research into nature, as if they were one in order to prop up a natural scientific world picture. The political, economic and military entanglements of the natural sciences are all too clear. They were, and are, the reconnoitering, the reconnoitering patrol, our civilization, desirous of domination, sent into the previously closed worlds of natural truths. What these patrols and pioneers of natural research have investigated and invented yields, in toto, something that threatens the existence of the object of research nature as a whole. Am I speaking merely metaphorically here? Not at all. I want to exemplify the polemical character of natural scientific empiricism with the object, Earth, to which all natural sciences right up to astronomy refer, and which remains at the heart of our interest in nature. It can be relatively easily demonstrated that and how the earth sciences are motivated by polemical practical interests. The activities of observing the surface of the earth as well as the spying out of the earth's interior serve, in many cases, political and military interests. For this reason, geography belongs more to the domain of strategy and ruler's science, geology more to the domain of weapon technology. For this reason, geography belongs more to the domain of strategy and rulers science, geology more to the domain of weapon technology. The first accumulation of geographic knowledge probably takes place in the heads of monarchs, conquerors and generals, although they do not have to be the ones who carry out the empirical research. As political subjects of power, however, they have a prime interest in collecting the geographic knowledge of others whether they be hunters, seafarers, merchants or philosophers. The unity of merchant, investigator and spy has long been well known. Right at the beginning of the European tradition of geography we find a thought-provoking episode. It is said of the Milesian philosopher of nature, Anaximander, that around the 6th century shortly before the beginning of the Ionian Uprising and before the entry of Greece into the decisive years of the Persian Wars, he constructed a philosophical sculpture, to quote Herodotus, an iron tablet in which the entire globe, all seas and rivers were engraved. The tyrant of Miletus took this model of the earth with him on a visit to the Spartans during which he wanted to request armed help from the Peloponnesian city-state. Quoting here, Gerhard Nabel from Die Geburt der Philosophie, Stuttgart, 1967, pages 37 to 38. Only the map could make the Spartans at that time comprehend the magnitude and the means of the Persian Empire. They learned to see themselves from the outside, became aware of their tiny size, and distanced themselves from the war. Even then, in the first moment, the spark jumped from geography to strategic calculation. And if on this occasion the philosopher maintains an advantage in knowledge over the strategist, this relation will soon be reversed. Geographic knowledge will be found with kings and generals, and hardly at all with philosophers. The travel diaries of the monarchs of the Middle Ages show how at that time the political ego of a system, its ruler, had to be literally in search of his subjects. In pre-centralised times, not all scattered corners of a political realm looked onto an unambiguously localised sovereign centre of power. Capital, residence, absolutist, castle à la de Escorial, the Louvre, Versailles. 
As the most mobile component of the system, the sovereign had to assert his power through his presence in various places. Only with the latter construction of systems of representation, with administrative officers and police forces, does a stationary central power become possible that makes the political realm, the state's territory, transparent for the view and measures of administration. Military political interests found a point of focus around which geographic, ethnographic and demographic details can unite into a store of knowledge. Modern geography, finally under the star of imperialism, discovery, conquest, missionary intervention, colonisation, world trade, draws general interest from within the educational strata of capitalist states to itself. It continues the old strategic perspective, only now all the more intensively. For the rest, it is often only the accident of war that founds a new epistemic interest. For lack of usable preliminary work of their own, the US Marines, before the landing of American troops in North Africa, had to ask the civilian population for photos, holiday films and other information about the characteristics of the coast of the probable landing site. In the age of strategic satellites and military information, such archaic methods have become superfluous. In the age of strategic satellites and military information systems, such archaic methods have become superfluous. The principal means of spying out the Earth's interior is metallurgy. In the womb of the Earth rest the metals, often doubly inaccessible due to the depth of their location and complicated bonding to rock. Behind the discovery, processing and distribution of these difficult materials, a truly enormous pressure of interest must be present, as well as an exceptional use value that makes the effort of processing them worthwhile. Metallurgy is the technically central science in the history of war. With bronze and iron, the hot phase of cultural evolution as well as the escalation of the art of weapons and war begins. With the advent of the age of artillery finally, the latter reaches its ultimate sophistication. All decisive types of modern weaponry and military systems, tank divisions, air forces, rocket bases, naval systems, etc., are basically nothing more than the gigantic outgrowths of the way in which artillery makes use of metals and explosives. Swimming, flying, motorised artillery systems. A political theory of the knowledge of metals can demonstrate the original connection between this central earth science and polemics. Knowledge of nature and of war are connected through a pragmatic chain of interests. Before iron weapons can be raised against an enemy, a campaign against the earth's crust must have taken place, a many-pronged, laborious and dangerous process. Deposits must be dug up, the ore broken up into pieces. The masses are transported to the smelting plant where they are transformed through the violence of fire into liquid. The substances are separated and are hardened with new amalgams, mixtures and coolings. They are heated red hot once more, forged, formed, polished. Only the will to war is able to subject the natural substances to such transformations with such violence as the technology of smelting and forging requires. In metallurgy, a humanity thinking of war opens up its grand offensive against the given structures of matter. What it inflicts on the, on the metals is nothing other than an anticipation of what it will inflict on the enemy with the metals. If the Iron Age, quoting Ovid, begins with the emergence of war, represented in the sword and the spear, the metallic weapons of striking and stabbing, the epoch before the emergence of gunpowder weapons is the golden age of war. With artillery, something like a second discovery of fire takes place in civilization. However, it is not the Promethean sun fire of long ago, but a modern volcanic underworld fire. Corresponding roughly to the invention of artillery is the development of the political centralized power and the spatial perspective at the beginning of modern times. For the first time it allows the opponent to be mastered from a distance. Herein lies its functional relation to modern administration and surveillance. The shell corresponds to the sovereign's gaze, 
into the decisions of a centralised administration. Since the Industrial Revolution, which emanated from the English mining districts, the metallization of society again assumes new dimensions. At the same time, the spying out of the Earth's interior proceeds with intermittent leaps. From now on, gigantic mines arise that eat into the blackest depths of the planet's bowels. Miners become the ghostly army of industrial civilization, the exploited exploiters. The labourers of the smelteries were, were advanced to the elite division of the capitalist attack against the Earth's miserly crust. In the end, the modern form of economy capitalises all mineral deposits, and with millions of breaches, borings and extractions, it pushes on with the mineralogical war against the Earth's crust in order to burn the extracted deposits, or to work them into tools and weapon systems. Everyday industrial civilizations decide on death sentences against millions upon millions of living beings and millions of tons of substances. In these decisions, the predatory relation of domination of Western cultures to the earth is perfected. We must take care not to view today's nuclear technology as exceptional. It is in reality nothing more than the consistent continuation of the mineralogical, metallurgical attack on the given structures of matter. The purest intensification of polemical theory. Here there is no discontinuity. The transcendental, polemical framework of our technology comprises the bronze sword just as much as the neutron bomb. At most, the transition from the Middle Age to the Nuclear Age signifies a new technological stage within the polemical structure and a new order of magnitude in the offensive means of self-preservation. In order to keep up their war against the other, modern competition egos and research egos conquered the previously most secret structural forms and energy sources of matter. In fact, in going beyond the metallurgical explosion of natural substances, ore, etc., they then overstepped the threshold of the natural structures of substances in order to reach the point where the previously most puzzling cosmic powers were bound. In fact, in going beyond the metallurgical explosion of natural substances, ore, etc., they even overstepped the threshold of the natural structures of substances in order to reach the point where the previously most puzzling cosmic powers were bound. But also on the nuclear level, the mistreatment of matter merely anticipates the mistreatment of the enemy. It projects the pressure for enmity between the rival societies by way of the relatively autonomous intermediate step of natural science onto radioactive matter. What we are prepared to inflict on the enemy if need be, sets the standard for which tools of annihilation are to be wrung from nature. What we have intended for the enemy, large-scale blanket annihilation through incineration, contamination, atomization, has to be first inflicted on the weapon. It is basically only our message to our opponents. It communicates what we intend to do to them. The weapon is therefore the enemy's proxy in one's own arsenal. Those who forge weapons make it clear to their enemies how they will treat those who forge weapons make it clear to their enemies that they will treat them just as mercilessly as they treat the club, the anvil, the grenade, and the warhead. The weapon is already the maltreated opponent. It is the thing for you. Those who arm are already at war. This war takes place de facto continually in intervals of hot and cold phases, the latter being misnamed peace. Seen in the polemical cycle, peace remains peace means a period of arming, displacement of hostilities onto the metals. War means accordingly the implementation and consumption of arms products, the realization of the weapons on the opponent, on the highest level of polemical technology. Our process of enlightenment reaches the point where it takes leave of a thousand-year-old dualistic tradition of metaphysics. The antagonism between res cognitans and res extensa in the cybernetic age becomes altogether invalid. To the extent that the res, substance, 
that thinks actually can be represented and produced as machine, the antagonism antagonism toward the res that exists in space, extension, disappears. In the meantime, there are modern artillery systems that in strategic jargon are called intelligent munitions or smart missiles, that is, rockets that perform classic thought functions, perception, decision making, in flight and behave quote unquote subjectively toward the enemy target. The existence of these systems signifies a metaphysical statutory declaration of our civilization. We have in fact become in large part subjects who think of themselves as thinking things, and in these thinking things that exchange blows in modern warfare. The difference between the hero and his weapon disappears. The megalomaniac self-preservation egos of our culture have externalized their own being as weapon. If, in the end, the self-sacrificing kamikaze pilots take over the function of the guiding system, res cognitans in persona, then, in the case of the most advanced weapons of the present day, this heroic subjectivity has become an electronic subjectivity. The manned dive bomber still presupposed a pilot who consciously took his inevitable death upon himself and demonstrated an ability to die peculiarly reminiscent of that quality described in ancient philosophy. In intelligent munition, this human factor is fully eliminated. A further degeneration of metaphysics to paranoia has come about. Live and let die is, accordingly, not only the secret agent's motto, but also the principle of modern warfare based on artillery and its extensions. With the thinking missile, we reach the final station of the modern displacement of the subject. Because what is called subject in modern times is, in fact, that self-preservation ego that withdraws step by step from the living to the summit of paranoia. Withdrawal, distancing, self-displacement are the driving forces of this kind of subjectivity. Artillery is only one of its manifestations, and especially in the form of electronic intelligent atomic munition is the ultimate outgrowth of self-assertion and world domination from a distance. The modern long-range ego wants to preserve itself without recognizing itself in its own weapon. It must thus be split off from it as far as possible. Intelligent munition satisfies this need. Since its invention, the schizoid structure the subject in the form of the state and the polemical self-preservation ego approaches its, its consummation. The next great war foresees only schizophrenics and machines as combatants, decisive homunculi in the state. Ghostly split administrators of destructive forces will press the decisive buttons, quote-unquote, if it has to be. And heroic robots, as well as thinking hell machines, will fall on each other, the experimentum mundi is at an end. Humanity was a mistake. Enlightenment can only summarize. Humanity cannot be enlightened because it itself was the false premise of enlightenment. Humanity does not come up to scratch. It carries within itself the obscuring principle of dissimulation, displacement, and where its ego appears, there cannot shine what was promised by all enlightenments. The Light of Reason